this live you want that public. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean it's run stream. I mean, <laughs> 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 okay, well we can look at to live launch Claim Health and Wellness. Thank you for joining us today. Yes. 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 We're uh, recording live from Orange, California. We knew you had a lot of other choices of things that you could have done today, so we appreciate you joining us. We're going to first have our prayer, and then we'll proceed on with our ribbon cutting ceremony. I want to introduce my pastors, Carlos and Pastor Wendy from Celebration Church. And that's in Santa Ana. They're also in the ministry, serving in Standing Shepherd's ministry. Uh, Pastor Carlos will lead us in prayer first. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that you prepared ahead of time. We yes. thank you for Vera and her dedication to you and to others, Lord. Will you continue to prosper her? Yes. May she succeed in all she does. And I thank you for the business that's starting. As you grow it, yes. you prune it, and you lead the way, Father. We love you and thank you for everything you've done in our lives. We dedicate it to yes. you as she has dedicated her life to you and to others, Father. And all those that play a part as doctors, uh, nurses, uh, police officers, um, firemen, teachers, we are truly blessed. So we bless this business and continue to lead her and protect her and prosper her. Yes. In, in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. And now we're going to have our ribbon cutting portion. Mm -hmm. So, what if we. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can hold it. Oh, okay. back to their seats. Thank you again for your patience. Thank <laughs> you. 
it's, as you know, the saying, it takes a village to raise a child, well, it takes a village to also start a business. So I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge my team uh, in no particular order. <laughs> and this is Bridget. Bridget is my videographer. She's the one who's very creative and do all the editing and the production on my videos on YouTube. Um, we've also launched our um, YouTube, I mean, I'm sorry, our uh, TikTok. Yeah. And oh, we got some of my there too. Awesome. And also, we launched our website today. Yeah. 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 I want to acknowledge David, kisses, <laughs> <laughs> David's Bridget's boyfriend, and he's um, our engineer, I guess, and also the lead uh, coordinator at the worship for church. Yeah. <laughs> and announce the doctor, we're going to have a full expert. Uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. And then this is my last one, Kyrie. Uh, <laughs> finishing up with his uh, two weeks, his degree at uh, getting his uh, bachelor's in communication. Oh. And then uh, part of my awesome marketing team, Abacus uh, marketing partners, uh, Nancy Aldrich Foster, all the way from Nevada. She joined us. And Nancy is is why this is happening the way it is. Oh, yes. And her other half is Gina. Uh, all the creativity that you see on all my social media sites come from Gina. And she's sick today, oh, so she cannot join us in person. But please uh, keep her in prayer. And then my second born is Jason Scott and his wife Martha, and my two grandsons Wesley. And Maxwell. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. So we will uh, give us a minute for them to take their seats, and I'm going to have Pastor uh, Wendy Guerrero come up and do our panel introductions. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm so um, honored to be able to uh, introduce our first panelist, Dr. Sanjay Mujetha. He um, is a senior fellow in hospital medicine, board certified internal medicine. Regional Medical Director, West Group and Vision Physician Services, Site Medical Director, Southwest Healthcare System and Vision Hospital, where he works as a hospitalist physician in Murrieta, California. He speaks English, Hindi, and Punjabi. Punjabi, sorry, Punjabi, that's correct. Yeah. He did his residency at Department of Internal Medicine, State University of New York, New York, Downstate Medical Center, Kings County Hospital, and VA Hospital, Brooklyn. Dr. Sanjay has been practicing medicine for 35 years, and he is married to Suman, who is here today with him, and they have three children together, two boys and one girl. Welcome. Thank you. Good to meet you. Welcome to take your seats. Okay, next up, next on our panel, we have Andrea Lopez, if she could join me up here. Andrea is a registered dietitian, she received her Bachelor of Science in Nutrition at the University of Texas at Austin and completed her diet, dietic internship at the University of Incarnate Word. Andrea is looking forward to completing her master's degree. Awesome. Is that coming up pretty soon? Um, a little bit, yes. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Andrea has been practicing as a dietitian for five years, and the past two years of this experience has been working in renal dietitian as a renal dietitian. Her passion for nutrition stems from wanting to help the community know that healthy eating isn't a sacrifice to be made, but something that can be molded towards each individual's health goals. 
Andrea's philosophy is healthy eating can be obtained while still preserving one's cultures, flavors, and customs. And she's also married and has an infant son. Welcome. Thank you. And the next panelist, Lane Wang Zing. I'm so sorry for the mispronunciation. She's a licensed acupuncturist and licensed clinical pharmacist. Long has worked as a clinical pharmacist for over 10 years, ranging from large academic medical centers to medium-sized hospitals. After witnessing the wonders and pitfalls of Western medicine <clears throat> at the bedside of hospitals, Lan decided to go back to study traditional Chinese medicine, TMC, doing so 14 years after she completed her doctor of pharmacy degree. Even now, as a licensed acupuncturist, learning never stops. She continues to study and research methods from different TCM, which is traditional Chinese medicine, masters in both acupuncture and Chinese herbal medicine, while working as a Chinese medicine practitioner and clinical pharmacist. Besides taking additional classes locally in order to observe and learn new techniques, Lin routinely takes the time out to visit hospitals in China and clinics in US and Canada to further her knowledge. She specializes in pain management and gastrointestinal issues. Lan is an owner and practitioner of apricot acupuncture and wellness located in Laguna Hills. In her spare time, she is also a professional photographer. Welcome to the panel. <laughs> And we have a very special lady coming up next. I like to call her Nurse Vera. <laughs> Vera Scott. She is uh, the founder here for, for Claim Health and Wellness. She received her Bachelor of Science in Nursing from North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University in Greensboro, North Carolina. Vera attended California State University at Los Angeles, where she received a health service credential. Vera brings 45 years of strong and diverse experience in progressively responsible positions. Before retiring in 2020, Vera spent 26 years working in the area of hospice as a clinical director and case manager. Vera became a, Christ became a Christian in the year 2000, where she launched Divine Health and Wellness Ministry at Fortress Community Church in Chino, under the leadership of now-retired pastor, Lawrence Witherspoon from 2003 to 2017. Facilitated, also, she's facilitated the following programs eating, um, healthy eating lifestyle program called First Place by Gospel Light, The Daniel Plan by Rick Warren, Dr. Daniel Amen, Dr. Mark Hyman, created program Taking Back My Health by Following God's Healthy, uh, healthy Health Style Plan 10 Weeks program. Developed from the book, What Would Jesus Eat? by Don Colbert, MD. She's CPR and first aid through the American Red Cross, certified, no longer a certified instructor, although. There occurred coordinated campaigns around National Heart Health Month and National Diabetes Awareness Month. Claim Health and Wellness is birthed out of Vera's own pain and suffering. 23 years ago, she was, she was able to reverse her gestational diabetes which means that you become a diabetic during the pregnancy. In September of 2020, Vera asked God to help her get well and started on her wellness journey. She has been able to lose 70 pounds and sustain it. Vera has three sons and two adorable grandsons. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for those beautiful introductions. Ask myself, how did we get here today? In spring of uh, April 2022, I embarked on a program called It's Your Time. Uh, it's a, a women's organization in, in the Inland Empire Women's Business Center, and they helped me with developing my business. So during that time when I was researching, okay, what are the health problems? What are the health issues? 
I mean, we know the obvious about obesity. We know the obvious, you may know some people who may have diabetes. Um, but when I was doing the research, it also showed me that uh, children ages 12 to 19 are on the uptick of getting type 2 diabetes. And type 2 diabetes is usually when um, adults get it. And that onset is usually age 45 to 65. So if the children ages 12 to 19 are developing type 2 diabetes, we're getting ready to lose a generation. And for me personally, it was, I cannot, I cannot sit by and let this happen. So when you find that there's a problem, there's no need in having pity on somebody. What can you do? That was my philosophy. What can I do to help? And that brings me here today because I know that those 12 to 19 year olds are going to face, and you'll hear a lot of this from the doctor, the problems that they're going to face that come along with being a diabetic. Okay. And so uh, a lot of this is all environmental, it's uh, lifestyle, what we're eating and what we're putting in our bodies. And so the dietitian and also our pharmacist will talk more about those uh, subjects. But I just wanted us, um, anyone that's hearing the sound of my voice, if you would just kind of follow this exercise with me, um, it's helped me to focus and help me to understand when someone is talking, and especially if they're given information, how does that wind up with, how can I help? How can I learn from that? And so it's just a little exercise if everybody would just kind of get relaxed and grounded. And then um, just think about your, you have uh, sight, but think about scales being on your eyes because when you leave here, the goal is that you will leave here with some information that you can use to take hold of to change what's going on in your personal life. And so just uh, hands up to your eyes, and we're going to pretend like those are scales right there. We're taking those scales off of our eyes, and we're putting those down. And now we're opening our eyes. Not only do we still have sight, we now have vision. So that is what I want you to leave here today with, that you'll be able to take hold of a vision for you moving forward on your health. And then how can you take whatever you're learning and share that with other people, okay? The other thing is to kind of put your hands up to your ears because we hear with our ears and just kind of remove that, no distractions and that you hear me, you hear the voice, but let what I'm saying to you, hopefully you can listen to what I'm saying and let that permeate in you, what I'm trying to say to you. And then the other is just put your hand over your heart and I'm praying that God would just kind of soften your heart to hear this information and that you would take hold of it and be able to, uh, again, use it. The other thing that I do is I watch what I say, the words that are coming out of my mouth, because it's power in the tongue. Whatever you say, good or bad, it has energy, it has power. And so you'll find that in, in scripture, uh, Proverbs 18.21. So we want to talk today, whatever we say, that we have taking a step back, we're listening and we're hearing, and we're going to try and take that information and move it forward. But it, whatever whatever we say, we want to make sure that it's life-giving, okay, and not going to cause destruction, destruction or death. And so that being said, I'm going to move into... Um, my portion of this is talking about kidney disease. The, I'm sorry, the, the function of the kidney, and then also symptoms that one person might have if they do have chronic kidney issues. So one of the uh, conditions that diabetics face, 
possibly down the road is their kidneys could fail. And the doctor's going to go into that a little bit more why that happens. But again, going back to those 12 to 19 year olds, they're, if they're getting that disease early, it's affecting them if they're getting diabetes early. So just to let the audience know, too, that, that, that if you're hearing me, dialysis is a 26 billion, with a B, industry. Now, if my kidneys are working, uh, I'm 67, and they've been working pretty good. But you've got some other younger people and, and Andrea may be able to speak to that. I don't know, don't know the average age of who's on dialysis, but I know if you look at, if it's a 26 billion industry, there's 5% growth that's gonna happen in the next five years. So where are those people coming from? They're coming from us. We're going to, if it's already projected because it's been an increase. And so what God led me to talk about is how can people save their kidneys? How can people save their kidneys? I have a friend who uh, works in the operating room and she works with patients who go and have to have shunts to get put in. And they go kicking and screaming because they've decided, I don't want, I don't want this done to me. But I know the doctor didn't wait till the last minute to say your kidneys are failing. And so we really need to be proactive in taking care of our kidneys. So what are some of the symptoms? Um, what does a kidney do? Five functions of the kidney. First of all, they help us to pass the urine, which is waste in our body. They also help filter out the blood uh, in the kidneys before it's sent back to your heart. They maintain the overall fluid balance and they filter minerals uh, from your blood. They filter waste material from your food, caused by the food, and then they also filter medications and they fi filter toxic substances. Filtering waste material, uh, I'm sorry, creates, and also the kidney function is it creates hormones that help produce red blood cells, promote bone health, and also regulate your blood pressure. Some conditions that um, if you have uh, kidney disease that you may know, these are symptoms, it's not all inclusive, and it doesn't mean that you necessarily have uh, kidney uh, function problems when I list these because they're kind of common, <laughs> can go uh, with other uh, conditions as well. So if you have any of these, and especially multiple ones, and you think there may be a problem with your kidney, then you should consult with your physician. But that would be, you may start to feel fatigued. You're tired all the time. You also may have trouble sleeping you might have an inability to concentrate. You may have dry, itchy skin. You also may have increased or decreased urination. You can have blood in your urine. And having a little bit of blood in your urine is normal. Yeah. Thank you, doctor. Okay. <laughs> uh, and then you also can have foamy urine. Uh, you might have puffiness around your eyes. You might have foot and or swelling in terms of your feet. Uh, you could have a reduced appetite. You may have muscle cramps. So again, these are important for you to follow up with your doctor. I'm gonna have the physician, uh, the doctor to speak and then we'll take any questions online or uh, here with our group as well. Should I use the mic or can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. So thanks, uh, Vera, and uh, uh, this organization. You know, uh, I just recently got involved uh, through a, a mutual friend uh, who is not here today, but I work with her uh, as a director for hospice. Um, and uh, you know, Vera just reached me and said, 
Uh, I need a doctor for my <laughs> panel discussion and just came out of the blue and you know I like such things and I love challenges and I said yep I'm here and here I am you know, so she was literally you know it was kind of late in the night and she was like I'm dancing on my bed now doctor. <laughs> <laughs> that, as soon as you said yes uh, she was dancing she was thrilled and so that is how you know things happen, and this is destiny. You know, she talked a little bit about why she's doing this, and uh, my wife is here, uh, and she can tell you so many examples. And sometimes she is ready to walk out on me. Uh, <laughs> that I do such crazy things, um, and I've been doing that all my life. So coming back to some serious, uh, you know, kidney uh, problems here, that uh, you know, just common um, sense. Uh, should prevail uh, for people that start getting these symptoms that where was describing you know why is this happening to me uh, I can tell you a little bit about my uh, health background you know without going into too much detail a year and a half ago I suffered a stroke myself and uh, you know do you see any issues any problems you know everything looks normal right but uh, the, the thing is Hypertension, which is high blood pressure, and diabetes are two illnesses that are called silent killers. You know, they don't have symptoms. They don't have, um, you won't even know that you're going through uh, these processes uh, within your body. But if you don't take care of them, they will definitely kill you, one or the other. And kidney failure is that part of uh, the journey that you go through and people suffer for nothing. You know, it can all be prevented. And that's why we are all here to talk about this and let people know, you know, educate them, starting from that uh, 12 year old that has no idea why things are happening to them. So it's our responsibility as adults, as parents, as professional uh, health providers to let them know that what can happen. Uh, again, without going into too much details, diabetes is uh, type 1 and type 2. I'm sure people have heard uh, those uh, uh, terminologies. Type 1 is mostly that happens at a younger age, you know, that the kids that, and uh, their pancreas, which produces insulin, you know, fails to produce enough insulin. And that's how your blood sugar is not metabolized uh, by the pancreas and it starts going up and you have to get insulin. Uh, you know, that's kind of uh, the only way that you can treat because the, the medications may or may not work, uh, the oral uh, ones. The other one is the type 2 diabetes, which happens uh, at a later age, you know, in the 30s and 40s. Uh, and we are seeing that happen earlier and earlier now. And what Vera was mentioning, one of the reasons is a poor lifestyle. You know, everyone is on their phones, you know, no one's going out. Kids are not playing outside. You know, I see my kids. You know, they're always video games and this and that. So you know, we are at fault. You know, um, my wife is probably going to laugh at me that you know I've been telling you this for years, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> nothing happened. <laughs> but you know, so those are the things that are common sense. You know, we need to get uh, ahead of the diabetes. You know, so that our kids don't suffer. Uh, the people who are now going through uh, that type 1 diabetes, they will get on dialysis because um, if you like it or not, 50% of those patients will have renal failure. You know, whether it goes into dialysis or not, but they will have some degree of renal failure, whether it's type, you know, say 1, 2, 3, or 4. And the reason why I'm saying this is this has consequences. Because once you start developing those uh, even minute kidney failure changes like protein in your urine. You know, you're still making urine, you're still functioning pretty normally, but that little protein in your urine, there's a reason why the kidney cannot reabsorb that protein and it starts spilling out in your urine. What is that going to do? Eventually, it will lead to cardiovascular disease, it will lead, lead to high blood pressure because of all the reasons that we are said that the kidney is producing all those hormones and uh, it will cause anemia, it will cause different types of 
illnesses that you won't even know why you're having the, these things. So again, prevention is definitely better than a pound of cure. A little ounce of prevention, if we can do ourselves and help our generation, the next generation, to realize uh, this is what needs to be done right now. If we don't do it, the numbers are going to go from billions to trillions. Uh, so I'm going to uh, stop here to see if uh, you have any questions uh, you know, pertaining to what I just said or anything that you want to know about you know, how the kidneys can be protected or uh, how to prevent you know, us from going into that stage of uh, no return, which is dialysis. Yes. So how can I, what can I put in place to help reverse the damage to my kidney? I'm not aware of any, but apparently it may be, and so I want to know how do I reverse that, or what can I do now, so that it doesn't go into a dangerous place? So, uh, let me answer the question by asking you a question. Sure. I don't know, I know it's not a good way to do it, but how long have you had high blood pressure? Uh, about that two, you know of? About two years. That's been diagnosed by your doctor, and uh, you are on medicine for that? Yes. Okay. So, you know, uh, the reason why I asked you that question is a lot of people don't know that they have high blood pressure. Yes. So it's good that you at least know. Uh, and the way to diagnose high blood pressure is not just go and check your pressure at uh, one of the stores and your pressure comes <laughs> high and you panic all over and oh my God, I got high blood pressure. No, that is absolutely wrong. You know, the best way to check for high blood pressure is multiple times when you are totally relaxed you know, 30 minutes after you wake up in the morning, after your normal routine, you sit down, you know, completely at peace and then check your pressure. That's your baseline blood pressure. If that is high, then you have high blood pressure. Sometimes we go to the doctor's office and it's called white coat hypertension. You know, so it's definitely going to go up. So those are not the times to check blood pressure. You know, every doctor's visit, you do check your blood pressure. But that doesn't mean you have high blood pressure. Right? Yeah. So, again, I wanted to clarify, you know, when you say you have high blood pressure, you really have high blood pressure. Yes. And you are taking medicine for that. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I can go into details of how you should control that uh, non-medically, because there are ways that you can do. So, first thing I would say is uh, uh, diet. Again, uh, we have a dietitian here. She's going to probably talk more about that. So, I'm not going to steal her thunder. Uh, <laughs> We have uh, uh, pharmacists, we have you know uh, the whole panel, so um, do you want to say something? Go ahead and uh, talk on diet for high blood pressure. Sure. Um, can anyone hear me? Uh, my voice is not as loud as uh, <laughs> sometimes I'd like it to be, but thank you. Um, touching base on what you're asking about, um, you know, high blood pressure, diet is a huge component to kind of helping that. Um, I don't know that there's a way to reverse the damage that has already been made, but there's definitely room for you to stop any further damage from occurring. Mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, as far as diet is concerned, making sure that you're um, trying to choose foods that are lower in sodium. So um, when I say lower in sodium, we need things that are tend to be more fresh and not, you know, full with like preservatives or things that usually are like in the frozen section that, you know, have a lot of salt to preserve them, but kind of doing a little bit more fresh things. Um, even reading the nutrition label, I know um, that can come quite as a challenge. It's not something that we're taught in school, um, but it's quite simple as um, if we can take some time to kind of understand it. Um, typically, you want to look at that nutrition label. Um, you see like the sections, uh, calories, fat, there's a section for sodium. Yes. Um, the milligrams, you want that to be around, let's say, 300 or even less. And I was just a comment from the your viewers online to make a question. I have a panel area, so let me put it here. Sure. Um, I hope this is better. Um, the question was, what can I do to reverse uh, damage uh, to my kidneys uh, due to hypertension? And specifically, um, the portion that I'm answering today right now is related to diet. So again, things to do. Um, Choosing fresher foods, not full with like a lot of sodium. Reading that nutrition label to make sure that the amount is around three hundred, excuse me, milligrams or less. 
And is that 300 milligrams per, based on a 200, I mean, 2,000 calorie diet? Yes. May I add something? Go ahead, go ahead. Since I went over to the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a, a different point of view to add in, in terms of diet. Um, besides low sodium, which I totally agree, and we just also agreed by my ancestors a thousand years ago, you want the plain, simple food. But one important thing that we as Chinese medicine doctor practitioner um, suggest is try to eat all the warm food and stay away from cold drinks. Mm. And GI, the your stomach, is your base of your health. Mm -hmm. So by putting, we said there's a stomach fire that helps uh, digest your food, and because the fire will increase the metabolism. All the ice will slow down the movement. S just freeze everything down. Mm -hmm. And if you just drink a whole bunch of ice drinks, even the room temperature water is not enough. It just dulls the fire. And as you destroy your stomach, you start to destroy your other part of the organs. So, you can eat some fresh fruits, but don't overdo it because a lot of fresh fruits, they're also cool at the same time. So especially don't just eat it when they're fresh out of the fridge. Too cold for your stomach. Mm -hmm. And for my patients with stomach issues, I actually tell them, don't get anything straight from the fridge to your mouth. Mm -hmm. So if you, very often we see the kidney insufficiency people, their stomach has very, very poor function to begin with. That's the end result, the downstream from the uh, poor stomach, then you see the, also the poor kidney function. Thank you. Thank you. I would just like to add to uh, the sodium part, you know, physiologically, I'm sure you have, uh, you know, read somewhere in school that sodium always attracts water. So that's the basic principle of why we don't want too much sodium in our body because that all that is going to just keep all the water inside. And what does water do? It just loads the heart. It's like a bag of water you're carrying on your back, which is not needed. So the heart has to pump more. Uh, to push that water out and then downstream uh, one of the things that happens is the heart eventually fails and then you develop high blood pressure and all those things so all these organs that we have in our body are connected you know if the kidney is not working right the heart's going to get affected and vice versa you know and then your whole body shuts down so again you know it's a little thing that you start with but it has a uh, steamrolling effect on all organs of your body. You know, again, um, these are really uh, things that you should keep in the back of your mind that everything that is going inside you is going to have an effect on your body, whether it's good or bad. So now, like uh, Lan said, don't you know put things in your body that are going to hurt your organs. You know, that's basic. Uh, you know, not even medicine. It's just. Uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, have, I have a question. I speak loud, so. <laughs> um, uh, I think, thank you, first of all. I just want to say that. Um, but um, most of my life, I was an athlete. And so the window of 12 to 19, you know, is uh, really important, I think, for us to talk about because. Um, the concern about um, diabetes, but the, also the concern about the sodium. Um, I know that you see Gatorade you know, on the side of every athletic field. Um, one thing I never liked about it is, you know, after competing, you know, you're, you are thirsty, so you, you know, put it all out there. And then you go to that Gatorade, it was like drinking 
salt, you know, just so much sodium. And so I think um, it's important, I think, for us to start there with educating because on the other side, you know, parents, like you said, video games mean they're inside. You want your kids outside. And so when they're outside and they start participating in sports and activities, we're being, um, you know, taught to ingest sodium and things of that nature. Um, and so I think there's a, a good spot to start with, you know, engaging in the community because that's what parents I hear all the time are talking about. I need my kids more active. Well, they're starting drinking Gatorade and you'll be busy with 800 grams of sodium and you'll be talking about it's cold and, you know, all those things I went through. Um, so I just wanted to say that I think that's a good place. And then the other question I guess I have is, um, what really is a good range for your blood pressure? Because even though I stopped competing, I go in and they say, oh, your blood pressure is low. You know, it's 96 over 60 which says I should still be competing. But, and then if it's, you know, uh, another the diastolis, you know, in the anastolis, I know it's shocking, I know. Good to see, good to <laughs> but, um, but my point is, you know, what's really a good range? How do you determine? I think that's a, that's a question so, I've always asked. There are definitely numbers to guide us, okay. but that's again, uh, what is on the guidelines. Uh, that doesn't mean that if you go four or five numbers up or down, you're gonna die. No, that's not you know how you should think of blood pressure. Um, when I was in medical school, it used to be 100 plus eight. You know, that's totally wrong. No, don't even write it. That's totally, because that was 35 years ago. Okay. That's how you know things change, and if you're not keeping up with what's the newest recommendations and what works and what doesn't work, you're gonna just keep that in mind. Oh, 100 plus 8. So when I'm 80 years old, my blood pressure 180 is okay. It's not. So the American Heart Association now came up with guidelines uh, a couple of years ago that say 130 is the number. So just imagine if someone's doing that math and doing 180. And the recommendation is 130. They're gonna die. They probably won't even get to it. You know. So th th those were the uh, you know faults that we were kind of working with. And now we have come to the uh, conclusion that that it has to be always scientifically based. You just can't think of you know someone just publishes something and you read it and that's gospel. No, <laughs> it has to be confirmed with RCTs. You know, which are uh, control trials. It has to be randomized. It has to be compared. So what I'm going to tell you now is the latest what is recommended by the American Heart Association, and that is followed everywhere in the world, you know, Europe and Asia and everywhere. So just remember that uh, one number, 130 over 80. Over 80. Yeah. So systolic 130 and 80 diastolic. So the less than that. Zone, what does that mean? I'm going to follow. Right? How much? It's 96 over 60. So, okay, so the question I'm going to ask you with that is, are you symptomatic? Do you have any symptoms when your blood pressure is that low? Do you feel dizzy? You have chest pain, so you're totally fine. You don't need anything. Maybe a little bit, uh, drink some water, like she said, have some warm water, your blood pressure will be totally fine. Mm -hmm. So, yes. yeah, so you know, what we do, I just did my uh, board recertification for internal medicine, we have to do it every 10 years. And guess what was the overarching theme of that exam that I just took? What? Not only blood pressure, blood pressure was an important thing, but to stop medicines. Because we prescribe too many medicines as yes. medicines. And yeah, so you know, the exam wanted to test us when is a good time to prescribe those medicines and when is not a good time to give medicines. Yeah. So a lot of those answers were to stop medicines. You know, so that was kind of that's what is cost going the raising the cost. You know, we spend trillions of dollars with the pharma. You know, I don't know how much I can say about pharma here, but I'm very against <laughs> prescribing medicine if you don't need it. Right. Yeah, that's and my wife can vouch for that. Yeah. So 
those are the things, you know, sorry, uh, pharmacy, you know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> strongly against taking too many supplements, too. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yeah. actually, my sister uh, just called me out of my and she said, my friend wants to ask you, if, is it oh, it's good to take ginseng? I said, no, you can't just yeah. take ginseng willy-nilly. Mm -hmm. It's not good for everyone. You mm -hmm. have to look at that person's condition. Mm -hmm. And there are different kinds of ginseng. So it might help you, it might harm you. So we can too many supplements is really not good. So for us, it's good to have um, free flow. We want it to be no obstruction, not just continue supplement. If you just keep putting things in and no free flow, you're gonna get into problems. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I think it's, it's really good. I just think that's an area. That's we'll the number, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Before we take any other questions, I just want to take a little break and just give, give you a little description of what Claim Health and Wellness is. Uh, it's an online uh, counseling, instructing, educating program, one-to-one, -one, and it's dealing with uh, me coaching individuals and other nurses on my team to help people who have diabetes, are overweight, or just don't feel good. I'm not, the program is not based to get anyone skinny, it's to help you develop your wellness, okay? In the process of getting well, you will lose some weight, but the whole thing is to find out why are you uh, not been able to lose weight, if that's what you're trying to do, and how to look at what your health issues are, and then how do we do, uh, you can sign up for a free 30-minute strategy session. You can go online, our, our website is up live today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ClaimHealthAndWellness.com. You can also, um, Right now, if you have not subscribed to my YouTube channel, please do so. I've got 18 videos up on YouTube. And I give you an extra bonus of all my dance moves. I do <laughs> Everyone, also like me on, uh, follow me on Instagram at Claim Health and Wellness. And you can also follow me on TikTok and um, see my dance moves there as well. But the important thing is to actually uh, YouTube is where you're going to find my educational videos. And then my uh, God just put on my heart because he healed my body and I want to help other people get well. And so, uh, and the way to do that is you've got to log in, you got to stay connected. And so those are ways in which you can connect with me. So, and my program is based uh, and science and it's also biblically based. It's based in faith. And so there's not a pie in the sky. It's going to take work for you to do the work, but I'm going to educate you and you'll be able to, to get the, reach the health goals that you plan that you plan for yourself. So we can take a few more questions and then I'm going to turn it over to Andrea so she can go on and, and talk to you uh, on what she has prepared in terms of uh, dietary. Do we have any questions before we go uh, there? Yes. Yeah. I've heard that uh, the urine smell, I have a friend who has diabetes and they were mentioning that their urine has a very strong, like a, almost a, almost a pol yeah, polish remover. Mm -hmm. so something that he said, he had mentioned that, is that something that yeah. is like- so that's that? called ketones. So in um, scientific language or in lab language, those are ketones. And that's a pretty advanced stage of someone who has uh, high blood sugar uh, with, you know, uh, almost getting into a stage called diabetic ketoacidosis. Okay. You know, they may not um, be hospitalized, um, but they won't realize that they're going into that stage, but it's very uh, critical that they get it checked right away. Um, and that's, uh, the one that smells like that is called the ketone is called acetone. You know, it's almost like the new washroom over that you're talking about. So that's why she's getting that smell. But it's definitely a serious condition if she has high blood sugar and she's smelling that urine uh, that way. So she needs to 
follow up with the doctor like it's all about. <laughs> and then we have a. a uh, yeah, I guess I, mine's a two question. Um, <laughs> one is on eating speed, and the other one is on eating portions. Um, are there like uh, good targets to meet in the speed and portion area if you're the type? Like, I mean, I I could vacuum food. I mean, I could probably do the whole thing back there, like in thirty minutes. Uh, but like, you know, I'm. I can't imagine that is good for my body. So I just yeah, recommendations on on that and, and why and why not to eat too fast or too much. <laughs> so definitely, you know, too much of everything is bad. That's the saying that you you've heard all your life, right? Yeah. But scientifically, I can tell you that, uh, and of course, uh, yeah, she will address you know the portions and those kind of things definitely uh, when we talk about diet. Uh, so let me ask you, do you? Feel okay after you gobble up all the food and. I'll say this: I rarely will have a moment where I finish gobbling food and then feel like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Like, it's probably like if I if I have a whole year, it's like that happens three times where I'm like, oh, that was a bad idea. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, I don't want to um, you know put you on the spot, but right. probably. <laughs> oh, thirty-one. See, so at 31, if you can do this, do you want to keep um, with your health when you are 61 and right. 91? Yes. So that won't happen if you continue. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why we are here talking about you're not 12 to 19, but even 31, you're not out of the window. Right. So, you know, uh, take a step back and start eating normally. Uh, <laughs> what you do is not normal. Yeah. So, so again, um, you can uh, clarify that. You know why? You know fast food and things are not good. So thank you. Yeah. We have a question from the chat. Yeah. So our, our first question. From um, Sabrina Shepherd asks, how much sodium should an adult have per day? Average two grams. So it's uh, for an average person's diet, you know, that has, let's say, uh, a 2,500 uh, calorie diet uh, or a 3,000 calorie diet, two grams of sodium is uh, enough. I mean, uh, you don't have to count each um, you know, food particle that you put in your mouth, but <laughs> Typically, a normal diet that you, if you don't add extra salt, uh, is within the two gram range. So your body can handle that. Which is again, to clarify, it's two thousand milligrams. You know, yeah. what was the lot. version you said initially? Sorry, two grams. Two grams. But what was the like the equation that you, you gave? You said two grams, but you said twenty five hundred calories. Oh, calories. the calories. So if you're Averaging uh, 25 to 3,000 calories, which normally a person eats, a normal right. rate person, two grams of sodium for that number of calories is the standard. Gotcha. But if you are, you know, uh, a bodybuilder or, you know, you need 5,000 calories, then your sodium can kind of go up to 2,500 or even more. Gotcha. Uh, your body can tolerate that. So, does that answer the question? Yeah, I'm sure uh, they're listening, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And um, Pamela Phillips asked just a general question. She said, I have diabetes and high blood pressure. I want to know how to keep my kidneys good. Kind of that's yeah, so we started talking about it, but there are a lot of things that you can do. Avoid uh, things that are going to affect, uh, you know, your uh, metabolism, like, um, you know, smoking, alcohol. Uh, do exercise, keep your weight under check, um, then any risk factors that you have for heart disease, because ultimately, what is going to kill you? Your heart is going to stop one day and you're going to die. Right? All of us are going to die one day. But these uh, illnesses that we're talking about, the diabetes and the high blood pressure, will make that uh, journey shorter for you. And to keep going on that journey healthy and fit, you have to take away those um, 
factors that are going to uh, be a struggle for you to be healthy. And those are the ones that I just uh, talked about, you know, the smoking, di um, alcohol, uh, good diet, uh, even, you know, sometimes vegetarian diets are good. I'm not against meat. I eat chicken and fish and everything. Um, but sometimes, you know, people say too much of red meat can affect your heart. Again, there are both sides to the story. Uh, we don't want to go into too much detail unless uh, you have something in your presentation about that. Uh, so again, first thing I would say is common sense. A lot of people don't use, it's not common to have common sense. You heard that, right? <laughs> <laughs> common sense is rare. <laughs> if you can get, so let's say she has hypertension and diabetes, how much does she know about her illness? People, when I see patients in the hospital, you know, I'm a hospitalist, I see them being admitted with hypertension and diabetes, almost 70% of my patients have those two illnesses. How much, and there's a wide range of knowledge uh, amongst patients that know just a little bit or nothing versus they know everything about their illness. You know, they're like masters of, they're like, almost like doctors. And they are so good, their hemoglobin A1C is less than six. Their blood pressure is 130 or 80. They take their medicine, they're compliant. They're the, the ideal patient, you know, but they still get sick and come to the hospital. So what I'm saying is, if you don't use common sense and don't know about the disease that you have, um, or the illness, whatever you want to call that, you can control these things even without medicine. You know, again, uh, without going into uh, the whole lecture about natural cure of disease, you know, uh, I'm still an MD and I don't practice. Um, medicine like the way we practice sometimes in India and even China without medicines. Uh, but there are uh, a lot of things that you can do to your body that you don't want, you won't need medicine. Um, so you can get rid of most of your medicines uh, if you do the right thing. So know about what is affecting your body. Just learn, you know, you don't have to go to medical school to do that. There's a lot of information out there that you can learn about yourself. But I want to make sure the doctor's not saying stop your medications. <laughs> you can still take your meds and then still be doing your, be proactive with your uh, interventions. And then make sure that the doctor, okay, your blood pressure is within a normal range and then maybe like uh, adjust your medicines. But we don't want you to stop anything uh, unless you're on the advice of your physician. And then we're going to go on and transition into having Andrea uh, talk on diet. All right. Uh, well, thank you, Vera, for having me. Thank, uh, you. thank you for the panel here um, and the audience uh, and our live feed here. Um, it's a joy to be here to help you guys with questions. Um, some of it, like the doctor was mentioning, is common sense, but some of it is not. And that's why we're here. That's why, you know, we educate, we um, we'll take your questions and we go over any question that you guys have. I think that there's no such thing as a stupid question. Go ahead and ask it versus keep it because that's at the end of the day how we learn, how we grow, how we're going to you know better ourselves. So again, any questions that you guys have, please I encourage them. Um, I'm going to start really basic because I think that these you know starting basic is kind of the building blocks of diseases and kind of understanding where nutrition and diet needs to be. So. Um, touching base on the three major macronutrients, um, we think carbohydrates, we think fats, and we think protein. So carbohydrates are the main ones, right? We're the delicious and not so good sometimes, but there's also options that are good. Um, they do get a bad rep uh, most of the time, but that shouldn't also, you know, always be the case. It's just understanding which ones are the better kind of sources of carbohydrates and which ones we should limit. And if we're going to indulge in them, which ones we should do sparingly. And again, carbohydrates are going to be the main source of energy for our brain and for our muscles. So that's the reason why we can't just say cut out carbohydrates 100%. Your body needs the carbohydrates. Um, as far as better sources of carbohydrates, so try and include higher fiber ones. So if you're thinking about, you know, fiber, think whole wheat, looking at the ingredient list when you're going through your foods, uh, making sure that whole wheat is listed as one of the top three ingredients, I would say, um, including, you know, 
plenty of fruits and vegetables. Again, I can go into more detail later on, but just a general spectrum of what carbohydrates are. Um, and again, that doesn't mean to say that you have to cut out rice, and pasta, tortillas, etc., from your diet. It's just understanding everything that you're having is a balance and understanding that that balance is really important. Um, so moving on to the second macronutrient, uh, fats. So fats are really important for hormone balance. They help absorb certain vitamins, specifically vitamin A, D, E, and K. Um, and best sources, because um, there's good fats and there's bad fats, um, kind of what the doctor was mentioning. Uh, red meats typically do have um, some of that source of bad fats, which are the saturated ones, but there's also good sources of fats that our body does need. So thinking, you know, plant-based, um, certain oils, think olive oil, canola oil, um, avocado, uh, certain types of fish like salmon that have that omega-3 will help as well. Am I going too fast? Is this too much information? <laughs> no. All right. Um, and then last but not least, um, protein. So protein is one that we kind of have in our daily life. Um, I know that you're talking about, you know, as an athlete, I'm sure that was something that was really important. Um, but it's also something that we need in our everyday life. So protein is the element or the macronutrient. That's the building um, block for tissues and our muscles. It also helps with enzyme uh, production. And again, thinking of better sources of protein. So if um, there's nothing wrong if you do have uh, meat in your diet, but it's just knowing what sources will be better. So thinking leaner. Uh, and when I say leaner, meaning there's not as much fat because um, animal products tend to have that saturated fat or that bad fat that can affect lead to heart disease and other type of complications. So. Um, taking off as much fat as possible from your meat. Um, if you're doing ground beef, for example, kind of going for the minimum 85-15, or if you can do like a higher percentage, like 90-95, that would be a better option. That just means that um, it has a higher um, percentage of leaner versus, um, you know, that fat. Um, as far as chicken, you know, you can indulge in chicken. Typically, chicken breast tends to be the leaner portion uh, or part of the chicken, but if you do the other part, you know, thigh, um, legs, just make sure that you're taking off the, the skin. That also has a lot of the, the bad fat there. And then again, fish usually is a really good source. Uh, salmon, um, I know there might be other uh, options. I'm not <laughs> a huge fish fan, uh, to be honest, but um, again, those are other sources of protein. Um, moving on, as far as, you know, kind of the topics that we've uh, discussed, um, unfortunately, diabetes and hypertension are the leading causes of why people um, might end up with kidney disease. And um, I don't think it's ever too late to try to start doing something about it. But I do think that our philosophy um, are currently is more do something because there's already a problem versus thinking, let's do something in preventative, you know, measure because I want to prevent it. So again, it's not to say that, you know, it's ever too late to start, but the fact that you're wanting and willing to start is a good step in the right direction. Um, as far as managing your diabetes from a nutrition standpoint, again, I think carbohydrates get a really bad rep. Um, and it's not to say that they're all harmful, but it's just understanding the ones that are better for you. Um, as a diabetic, you just need to be careful with the amount as well. And usually, um, you also, you know, I think <laughs> doctors might kind of sound like a broken record and say, how do you check your blood sugars? Are you taking your insulin? Are you taking you know, your medication? That's not always the case for all diabetic patients. Um, and to, you know, the doctors um, and Mia's uh, standpoint, you know, it can be done without medication, but um, it's going to take some effort. It's not going to be, you know, just kind of uh, easy. Uh, it takes dedication as far as understanding, you know, your diet, balancing it between these three macronutrients and exercising. Um, that's a huge component. Exercise does bring a lot of benefits. Not only does it make you feel good, um, so kick of endorphins there, but it also helps regulate your blood sugar. And that's a you know, huge important part of why, you know, physicians and other healthcare professionals do encourage um, exercise. Um, and again, it is really important to be checking your blood sugars um, as a diabetic patient. I know it can be seen as like, oh, it's, it's another thing that I have to add to my list. But if you really are serious about kind of 
preventing any complications that can arise. It, it just takes a little bit of time. Um, and let's say, you know, you're on something and it's not working to maintain your blood sugars. And that's when you, you know, can reach out to a dietitian like myself, um, talk about what your diet is looking like, are the medications that you're on not working, things like that. Um, I'll open the floor to any um, questions that you guys might have. So I just uh, wanted to uh, comment, great uh, presentation. Uh, what do you uh, recommend for the vegetarian protein, because like my wife, you know, she doesn't eat meat, so, um, and she needs the protein like all of us. So can you talk about, you know, how vegetarians can keep up on their protein? Yeah, absolutely, great question. Um, so vegetarians uh, typically, you know, have a spectrum, right? There's vegetarians that don't have any type of animal products, so they exclude fish or eggs. Some vegetarians do include um, fish and eggs. So um, my first recommendation would kind of be, you know, Check in with your primary care doctor. Make sure that your B12 levels are, are good. Um, but best sources of um, protein for those vegetarians would be things like legumes. So um, beans, if you like chickpeas um, or garbanzo beans, um, lentils. Lentils are a huge and really, really good source of protein and fiber as well. Um, I know some people don't really like it. Um, it definitely has um, an acquired texture for sure. Um, uh, tofu. Tofu is also a good source. I don't know if you like tofu. <laughs> you do? Okay. And yogurt also. Yes, yogurt. Thank you. Um, back to the speed question. <laughs> um, Thank do you, you have a video. recommendation on how to like slow down um, because I, again, I'm the type of person, I'm at the restaurant, the food comes, everyone's like, this is great. I'm like, where's my food? Because it's gone. Um, like, how, so like, what are like strategies to like eat slower? Um, I think um, I would probably recommend kind of more like mindful eating. And I know it, it sounds strange, but it truly is a technique that I would encourage you to follow in the sense of take the time to kind of see what's going on, but also looking at your food and think about what is on your plate in front of you. Like observe and kind of make a mental effort. Like I know that you probably see it, but maybe you don't take that time because right. you're speeding through it um, to kind of look at the vibrant like colors that might be on your food, kind of noticing the textures that your food has. Um, once you start taking, you know, a bite and making that, I would encourage a smaller bite, <laughs> um, you know, kind of, um, thinking about the texture of the food, like what feelings you might kind of come like, you know, oh, this is not so good compared to this. But I would say more mindful eating in the sense of really thinking about everything that you're putting in your mouth to like the slow chewing really will kind of help slow you down and ultimately kind of have, a, again, slower eating pace, but also just mindfully making that effort and thinking about what's going on. Um, that might even help you realize that you're actually fuller right. at a certain point instead of, you know, speeding through the whole thing and then, you know, oh, I was full like 10 minutes ago. You didn't give your body enough time for the hormones to kind of, um, you know, give your brain that signal like, oh, I'm, I'm full. Right. So, again, mindful eating and looking at what you're doing, kind of taking the time to chew it, feeling the textures, thinking about the flavors will definitely help. We have a question from here. So we have uh, one question from Jan Marie, and uh, this is just a follow-up to your tofu uh, answer. She says, do you have any good tofu recipe? Chef on the side. I like to consider myself a chef. <laughs> My husband thinks I am, but I'll... Uh, <laughs> um, I took... Typically, um, tofu, I would I don't have like a specific recipe. Um, I know that tofu needs to kind of have the water that it comes with like absorbed. So kind of patting it down with um, plenty of paper towels to remove that fluid um, that it comes with. Um, I would suggest looking at diabetes.org for, you know, good sources of recipes. I know that they're also diabetic friendly. Um, 
but personally, I own an air fryer, and I love that thing more than everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, and crispy tofu um, is really, really good. Um, again, I don't have a recipe off the top of my head, so I do apologize, but um, diabetes.org, and I know that the air fryer comes with a recipe book that I would, you know, maybe take a look at. <laughs> Do you have some recipes? Do you want to say something? Spicy and even recipes. I did want to add, Vera, because I know that um, you had asked me, and I do apologize. Um, in kind of understanding kidney disease, um, that um, comes with a lot of issues um, to the doctor's point as well, um, not only from a health perspective, but also from a diet perspective, um, meaning that a lot of the things that, you know, you used to be able to have before, unfortunately, you may not be able to have. Um, if you're in, you know, the stage three or stage four um, kidney disease, um, again, there's things that you can do to kind of not, you know, completely stop, but maybe kind of um, protect your kidneys as much as possible. Um, obviously, that's a conversation that you guys want to have with your physicians or your doctors. But if, you know, your potassium levels or your phosphorus levels are high at that point, then, you know, dietary or food changes need to happen. Um, again, if you don't know what stage you're at, please have a conversation with your doctor. Um, if you're at stage three or four, usually protein restriction is something that we do implement just to help protect that integrity that your kidneys still have. Um, but again... If you're unsure, talk to your doctor. If you don't know how to go about that, please talk to a dietitian. You know, part of it is also having and helping you feel good while still preserving that kidney function that you might have. My question is, how does protein affect your kidneys? If, if you're uh, a diabetic, not, not diabetic, but if you are in renal failure, why is protein restricted? Doctor might be more able to go into the pathophysiological sure, yeah. detail, but basically, um, yeah, basically your your kidneys are already damaged um, in the sense that that filter is not working the way that that it should. So by putting more protein through that filter, you're just damaging it a little further. By restricting the protein, you're helping protect the filter as much as possible. Yeah. So in technical terms. Uh, what we check for kidney function is two things. One is the urea content. It's called the BUN. You know, it's a blood urea nitrogen. And that is uh, the protein that is filtered from your kidney. And the other part of that is creatinine. So the creatinine is also uh, kind of uh, the protein that is filtered from uh, your kidney. It is, there are a lot of other things that uh, you know can mess up with your tubules in the kidney and cause uh, conditions like glomerulonephritis and all those kind of things. But again, without going into technical details, those are the things that increase. So the kidney is not able to filter the urea, and the urea causes a lot of uh, havoc in your body. It can, if it goes up really high, uh, you can almost uh, go into a coma. It affects your brain right away. So mm -hmm. that's called a uremic encephalopathy, which means that you present to the hospital like you, you're drunk without having any alcohol. And what is doing that is the extra protein that you're taking, which is not being able to be metabolized and accreted from the kidney, and you become uremic. So again, um, you know, you have to be careful what you put in your body. Um, you know, you can't just eat anything uh, without knowing what's gonna happen inside. Uh, again, you don't uh, have to go to medical school to know all these things, you know. This is information that you can discuss with your physician. If your kidney function is getting to that stage where, you know, you know, stage two or three or four, you don't want to go into dialysis, you know, because that's the next step. You don't check it right now. Um, so again, um, I hope that answers the question, because protein definitely can hurt uh, if it's in excess, you know, especially patients with diabetes and renal failure. What about a person who unbeknownst to them, they don't have any kidney problem, but can being a high meat eater yeah. Yeah. start to damage the kidney? Again, it, uh, it depends on whether your kidneys are able to filter that creatinine and the urea. If the kidneys, if your GFR is 90, which is, you know, absolutely normal, 
then whatever you eat is going to be filtered and will keep getting filtered. You know, uh, but if you start damaging the kidney and it's the GFR comes from 90 to 60, which is also a lower lower limit of normal, but you know it decreased by 30 percent. So you have to keep track of you know what your uh, numbers were. You know when you were younger, when you were um, you know um, 31. Uh, <laughs> and you know, what it is now when you are 60. So it's always a good idea to uh, at least check your um, blood work, you know, during your annual physical, just to make sure that everything is correct at baseline. And then, you know, if um, you do it five years from then, you, if you have a problem, then at least you know that five years back it was this and now it's this. So just that little uh, jump, even if it's normal, is, uh, is significant and you can prevent it from getting worse. So, you know, that's why we do annual physicals, you know, and again, um, there's no, uh, you know, the recommendations are after 18, everyone should at least get uh, their blood checked once. Uh, and if everything's okay, then you're fine, unless you run into any uh, problems you know, with anything else. So, we'll go on and move on to our- Oh, there's a question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I have a question. Uh -huh. um, you already know that I struggle with the, the blood pressure thing. You talked about the mm -hmm. sodium. So what happens where, this is a diet question, when you're doing well on your diet, and you're, you know, following the guidelines and everything, and all of a sudden, my biggest downfall is potato chips. <laughs> so then I go on this binge of just potato chips. I could down a family size bag of potato chips like in two days. You know, and I, I mean, I don't know where it comes from, and just be like, all of a sudden, I can't get enough salt. So, how do you how do you counteract those binges? I mean, what brings on those type of binges, whether it's for salt or whether it's sweet, you know, or sweets or something that you're trying to stay away. That's a great question. Um, because the, whether you believe it or not, I eat potato chips as well. <laughs> and I do, you know, find myself sometimes struggling with, you know, control. I mean, we're all human. It's a realistic kind of thing that, you know, sometimes there's something that's sometimes not it's delicious. We know that it's not too good for us, but we keep indulging in it. That's just the reality of things. But making that mental effort of stopping kind of takes, you know, um, more of us. Uh, to answer your question, I think you know, finding a substitution that may be a healthier alternative, or even if you want to take on the challenge of making your own quote unquote potato chips, where, you know, you could um, make them yourself. Again, I'm not trying to advertise the air fryer, but, <laughs> but it could be a healthier alternative and like, you know, making your own, maybe not using as much, you know, salt, but um, using like a blend of herbs that you enjoy, you know, whether that be garlic powder, um, parsley, um, things like that to kind of flavor your food instead of, you know, thinking that salt has to be the component that flavors your food. Um, and that's what I, you know, love about my field, that there's so many things that we can do to kind of preserve what we find is special to us, whether that be our culture, whether that be stuff that we're craving in the moment thinking about a different approach to it. So again, maybe that could entail you cooking it yourself. Um, as far as, you know, if you do end up getting that uh, bag of potato chips, maybe, you know, practicing more self-control, you know, saying, okay, I'm not gonna eat the entire bag. Maybe I'm gonna have half of the bag. If you do find yourself going in the grocery store and making a decision or, you know, you're standing in the grocery store aisle and looking at the different potato chips, there are lower sodium options, you know, um, and it does say, you know, no salt added or lower salt, maybe kind of seeking those options as well. So I hope that helps answer your question. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I, I just have um, a comment about that because I did the same thing <laughs> <laughs> and you know something that has helped me that there's good things my husband started buying like the 100 uh, calories like this small box mm -hmm. and now I'm like okay I'm gonna eat one bag and that's it so that I, I, for me that has worked and the other thing is uh, we couldn't make my kids eat kale because we don't have like a little bit of a bitter yes. mm -hmm. taste 
And when my husband has been doing is uh, he put it in a cookie sheet in the oven. We use the oven. Mm -hmm. And they come out like crispy. But he put like the seasoning and stuff and it's kind of like help them to chip. We <laughs> 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 have the crunchy stuff, yeah. You have to be creative. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Lay's potato chips is my thing too. When I, when I have the taste for Lay's potato chips, and I, I don't eat them all the time anymore, but I just buy that two serving bag and I'll eat that and I'll have it in the house and I'll finish it. But I don't go buy the family size because the temptation is too great. And so I just do that serving and then I'm fine for quite some time. A lot of it is in the mind. Yeah, and, yes. and, and then discipline. I think I heard that word. So we can't, don't try to give in to your temptations all the time. Question. I was just going to also add my little strategy is just not turning it into my phone. Yeah. 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 But if I'm at a barbecue, at a car birthday party, then you can dissolve and have your chips. But for me, it's easier to not have it. Yes. One more question from we have in this well, I have a question. Yeah. Um, is it good to eat a lot of fruit? Because <laughs> I, I like to eat a, a lot of um, acai bowls, and I get flat from that from my mom. <laughs> 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 Excess can be bad. Um, however, you have to kind of look at it, you know, like what else are you including in your diet? Like, are you binging on acai bowls all day long for like two weeks at a time? Or are you having other stuff, you know, um, as well? It, it really just comes down to, you know, fruits are good. They're definitely better than having like a, you know, half of a cake by yourself. But at the end of the day, they're also carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. You will get vitamins from the fruits. You'll get other, you know, benefits such as fiber, antioxidants, things like that. So, um, you know, it's the lesser of the two evils for sure. But at the same time, again, it's f trying to find that balance where it's, you know, there is such a thing of having too much fruit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, to me, too much is not good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and as I said earlier, um, you probably just to get out of the fridge and just start eating it, or you, at least you leave it at room temp. Yeah, it, it, it usually cold. Yeah. <laughs> when you're young, we have a lot of we uh, we are big in yin and yang, uh, yin and yang, but we actually pronounce it as yang. So young people has a lot of fire, has a lot of yang chi. So. You might feel good now, but as you get older, you need to cut down the portion. It's <laughs> just like 31 year old guy. <laughs> you have a big stomach fire, but as you get older, your stomach fire will get smaller and smaller. So you, can, you cannot digest as much. And you don't want to use it up now. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, going back to my old, uh, old job of being a pharmacist. Yeah. I'm, I'm still practicing as a pharmacist on the side, just to keep it up. <laughs> okay, so medications. So there's a lot of uh, drug inducement for nephrotoxicities. So about 20, um, about all the acute kidney injuries, about 20% is caused by medications. Mm. And kidney is a big uh, site to eliminate the um, the medications, and at the same time, it can cause um, a lot of medication can cause kidney uh, damage, and this is through many different mechanisms, which we're not going to discuss today. But just need to keep in mind that a lot of prescription, including also the over-the-counter, even don't think that over-the-counter medications are safe. So. 
just like ibuprofen motion, it can cause a lot of kidney damage. Uh, damage. And the kidney injury from medications, it's very often a reversible if you catch it early. So early recognition, recognition is very important. Don't just ignore it. I know a lot of guys, they just, they think they can tough it out. <laughs> but pay attention to your urine output, to the color, and discuss, uh, discover it earlier, and you might save yourself. And then uh, there are other risk factors for the drug-induced uh, kidney toxicities. So the first one will be age. If you're older, of course, you are at more risk. And then the second one is diabetes, of course. Diabetes is a big, uh, is a big challenge. And then um, if you already have the bad uh, kidney function to start with, you are at high risk, of course. And then volume depletion. So volume depletion, it could mean that you be hydrating um, if you're not drinking enough water, or it can mean it could mean that you lose some blood, either from <coughs> stomach bleeding or whatever bleeding from your body site or from operation. A lot of times, like cardiac surgeries, post uh, surgeries can also cause kidney injury. And then, um, if you the other risk factor is if you are exposing to if you are exposing to a lot of different nephrotoxins. So nephro means kidney. So nephrotoxins, kidney toxins. And then um, next one is uh, if you like heart failure is a big risk factor for the uh, drug induced uh, nephrotoxicity. And then the last one is sepsis. Sepsis, it's a uh, basic, it's like if you get any um, kind of like, most often it's a bacterial infections. So all of those you need to keep in mind that increase the risk of uh, toxicity in the kidney. And then um, as far as uh, supplements, uh, and herbs, I know it gets a lot of bad reps for, especially herbs for natural toxicity. And I also strongly discourage just taking supplements. It's better to have to exercise, to eat it right, to sleep well, and then keep a very uh, active lifestyle. And you have a um, good healthy diet. Good, a healthy diet is better than supplementing. You don't need all those supplements. The only I, the only supplement I do actually for myself is something for kidney. <laughs> but I'm not here to advertise anything. Um, I take some kind of like kidney formula from that was a formula way from maybe a, a uh, thousand or two thousand years ago, I don't remember. But they emphasize, they do two things at one time. So they supplement and then they drink. So they don't just purely supplement you. So don't just, uh, especially Asians, we tend to do a lot of supplementation. <laughs> so my dad, my pet, my my mom, my dad, they have full kitchen table. Of <laughs> but like I told them, like if you take calcium, if you don't exercise, it does you more harm than bad than than good. If I can add, yeah. Um, yeah. To, to her point, I, you know, if, if you have a well balanced diet, the supplementation shouldn't take place. Um, mm -hmm. And think about the money that you're spending as well on supplements that really won't help. The only supplement that I would, you know, encourage you to potentially ask your doctor about, and this is for everyone, just because we don't get enough time in the sun, is probably vitamin D. Um, and again, that's under the supervision of your physician, checking your um, levels and making sure that, you know, it is okay for you to take something like that. But again, um, to your point, I uh, agree with you. And I can add, you know, some of the supplements can actually hurt you more because 
where are they going to go? They're going to go into the liver or the kidney. So your body has to work more to filter those. For example, a lot of people started taking mega doses of vitamin C during COVID. You know, what did that do? That caused renal failure. Because, you know, what is that vitamin C? You All you need is a few hundred milligrams. You know, if you take 10,000 milligrams of vitamin C, that's going to mess up with your kidney. Um, if your body is not made for that much uh, vitamin C. You know, you get vitamin C in the market, you know, uh, I used to go to look for vitamin C and it was gone off the shelves. You know, you couldn't even buy it because people got somehow in their brain that, you know, the more vitamin C you take, uh, you know, you're protected against COVID. You know, it doesn't work that way. So, you know, the education part is so important for people to realize that, you know, uh, they just get a news flash somewhere and, you know, they start taking all these uh, supplements, uh, which is absolutely incorrect and harmful for your body. So just be careful what you're putting in. Yeah, and then the other thing is I, um, given a course of your medications, um, if you notice your urine output, uh, you pee less, or there's some problem with your urine color, um, talk to your doctor early because your kidney function changes. So a lot of times we, as pharmacists, we adjust a lot of medication dosage down uh, according to the patient's kidney function. But for outpatient, for the patient outside the hospital, there's no way for us to help. So if you, it relies on you to, to do that, to recognize it early and then go to the doctor and you might need to adjust the dose to avoid a kidney injury. Yeah. I have a question because um, I heard my knee last um, January and they gave me the Clofenac as a cream. I, I don't, it's just a cream for outside. Is that like could it's, be damaging as well, my kidney? That's locally applied topical. It's very um, little absorbed to the body, so it's it's okay unless you have like very damaged uh, skin and not intact skin. Then yeah, so unless you ingest it or through the vein or through the uh, injection through the muscle, oh, okay. then those yes. have more side effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, topical usually is less. Yeah, because he told me the same thing. He said I don't want it to be taken ibuprofen or anything, mm -hmm. but he gave me the yeah. So I, as an acupuncturist, I actually sometimes I use uh, ibuprofen too, but I really limit it to, I ask my patient to take it two to three days only. So limit the course, shorten it. And take it with food. Yes. I have a fruit or a, a toast or a banana. And then, so you have some, some lining in your stomach, otherwise it's going to make a hole in your stomach. And then you start feeding, yeah. Um, for working out, being active, um, specifically like for the, the goal of like keeping weight under control, is that something that you should do on a calorie deficit and like first thing of your day before you break fast or like is that something you should do after you've eaten? Um, I'm just curious. Could, could you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Right, so if you're like trying to be like do an activity like working out or a brisk walk or a run, um, and the, the intention of it is like weight control, um, is that something you should do on a calorie deficit? Or is that like before you take breakfast, whenever that is during your day? Um, or is that something you should be doing like after a meal or after breakfast um, within a certain time frame? So so your ultimate goal is to lose weight? Uh, yeah. Not necessarily lose weight, just maintain. Like maintain yeah. um, so it's kind of looking at the general picture, like there's no right time or wrong time to exercise. Um, that's gonna depend on what functions for you, what's gonna fit your lifestyle better. So there's no right or wrong time to exercise. It, that's dependent on yourself. But as far as like maintaining the weight, I mean, you wanna, again, look at your diet and make sure that, you know, Again, I, I can only give you general uh, yeah. guidelines, right? I, I can't go into the like, specifics. Um, if not, I'd be here all night. <laughs> so but, I can um, add to the 
specific for diabetes. I know you probably don't have diabetes, but uh, for patients who have diabetes uh, on uh, online and also uh, if you have, uh, what is recommended is to do your exercise after you don't sit down after you eat. So move after you eat so that that's the best time that you know uh, the sugar level uh, will not go up. If you exercise or even take a walk after you have dinner. Uh, but don't just sit down, uh, you know, immediately. So that's kind of what is recommended. But uh, for a run, for a person like you that is healthy, otherwise, you know, she's right. Uh, there's no specific uh, guidelines for that. And you can correct me if I'm wrong. Exercise tends to open those channels and absorb the glucose, which is the right. recommendation so, that you're suggesting. Exactly. That's but, why, you know, you uh, secrete more insulin and all that. It keeps your sugar under control. But again, to your point, Whatever fits with your lifestyle at that um, From Chinese medicine standpoint, there's actually a time. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so um, they go by seasons. So in the winter, it's supposed to be storage, hibernate, more like hibernation, kind of like natural way. So they recommend to exercise when the sun already rises after the sun rising up and then also don't exercise on, uh, after sunset during winter but in spring and summer it's okay you rise early and just go run and it's okay like sometimes if your schedule doesn't fit you can still exercise before the sun comes comes sun comes up it's good to rise early in summer and in, especially in spring and then, um, so the other thing about um, going back to your hypertension, or your high blood pressure. So from our standpoint, like, some of the um, high blood pressure we see is very obstructive flow. And for the obstructive flow, we see is your body accumulates a lot of, we call it cold and dampness. And so that really blocks the flow. And Food is a very important thing to pay attention. So warm food that I told you, and then also I asked my patient to avoid dairy. Mm -hmm. For kids, they have a lot of young, a lot of fire. They're okay. But adults, they you know, we don't really need the dairy as much. Although you can say that calcium, you can take calcium from other sources. I know this is against the Western medicine. I also work in a hospital um, that they allow a lot of Western medicine recommend dairy for the calcium. But for, for my patient with the um, issues, I ask them to avoid the dairy. And then also the other thing is green tea. Green tea has a good reputation of being healthy and antioxidants, but so, but what we found is that like green tea is actually has a colder property. And um, so long-term, large amount, like every day you drink a lot, is actually very harsh to your stomach. Mm -hmm. So it's better to drink the black tea. Black tea is fermented, it's warmer, it's more gentle to your body. And then like seafood, it tastes great and has a lot of protein. But the thing is like the property of seafood is cold. So if you like to eat it, spice it up. So add some ginger, add some pepper, bring up the temperature. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so, but I don't mean like the chili pepper, really spicy. So I, I found a lot of patients, my patients, who like spicy food, their upper, their upper um, stomach tract mm -hmm. um, is fat. So it's, there's all the spicy food can, uh, <coughs> can damage your um, the, um, the gastrointestinal tract. Mm -hmm. So like for myself, I actually avoid it now because I had three times of duodenal also bleeding. Oh my God. Oh. From the spicy food, you said. I ate a lot of spicy too, and I also uh, work under a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. 
So after three times, my like first time I had even broken up six. <laughs> yeah, so now I don't eat spicy food. And then um, the other thing is like, uh, when I was still working full time as a pharmacist, I tried to change my uh, lifestyle. So I started eating like my, for my lunch, I started eating whole big pile of salad, cold salad in the fridge. And every day I just put in the fridge at the work and then at lunchtime I just took it out. After a month, I got so bloated. And I didn't understand why I thought I was supposed to be more healthy now with the new diet. But once I got into Chinese medicine, I found out why. Because of, I have bad stomachs to start with. I can't take it. Maybe you can, you, you'll be okay. But I couldn't. So I have more risk factor than I'm older, I'm 50. So um, that salad, cold salad, is, I couldn't really take it. So it depends on your condition. Take it or leave it. <laughs> I know it, it sounds crazy. Like I went, I went into went back to school, and then my professor was telling me to avoid salad, avoid fruits. I was like, you crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but because my stomach is not not that great to take it, so I was told to either slightly steam the um, veggies or slightly stir fry it. Don't want to cook it for too long, you lose all the nutrients. Yeah, but at least bring up the temperature. Be gentle to your diet, uh, to, to your stomach. And so a lot, and also like even a teenager, teenager girls are especially important to have warm uh, food because you're there, period. A lot of teenager girls, they do a lot of cold drinks. Like they wear sh very short skirt during winter. Mm -hmm. All those are really bad for, for them to have normal period. Mm -hmm. And also they don't, they try not to eat on their own diet. <laughs> also a lot of them, they don't have regular periods. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about um, the GERDs and uh, spicy foods with the one to the GI tract? So and bird, then, uh, I do have the, it. The, the meds that someone might be taking over the counter uh, for so, that. Yeah, uh, over the counter GERD medication, like uh, we call it PPI in the hospital, the, the health professionals. Mm -hmm. So it can also lead to the um, induced, there's a possibility of induced uh, uh, kidney toxicity. So pay attention to that. And then um, for me, I do have the. Mm -hmm. Now I don't have as much. I pay attention to what I eat. Um, so I used to, even as I got into the Chinese medicine program, I still try to cheat. I would eat ice cream, I would eat like foods. And then as time goes along, I found that each time I cheated, I suffer. <laughs> I have a bad heartburn. So as, as time goes on, I, I learned I'd rather not cheat. Like last year, my manager was like, oh, today you guys work so hard. Uh, it's my treat. I'm going to treat you guys an ice cream cone. And then I said, no, I think I want to just be good. And I don't want to, like, my stomach has been at peace last few weeks. I don't want to cheat again. <laughs> so just like for you, like sometimes I, you binge eating those other things that you're not supposed to eat. Mm -hmm. But then once you suffer for three times, you might start to cut it down. Yeah. So for the if you're gonna eat, I'm going back to the cold food. If you're gonna <laughs> eat a salad, it's okay to just let it sit out for a while. It's better that way, but if you do have stomach issues, I would either I would even bring up the temperature. So just slightly cook it um, because the room temp is um, 25 degrees Celsius or maybe 60 or 70 degrees Fahrenheit. But your body temperature, your body temperature is like 98 or whatever. I'm not very familiar with the Fahrenheit, but it's a uh, like 
is 37 degrees Celsius versus 25 degrees Celsius, 12 degrees difference. So REM 10 is still not enough. Yeah. So I now I carry my thermostat everywhere. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? Uh, so we have um, one question from Barbara Shelby. She says, I take a lot of extra strength Tylenol. Does Tylenol harm the kidneys? Um, Tylenol will, but harms liver more. And you have to limit to four grams a day if you don't have kidney, I mean, the liver issues. But if you have liver issues, cut it down to two grams a day. And pay attention, there's a lot of over-the-counter medication that has acetaminophen, which is the, mm -hmm. the component of the title. Title is a brand name, acetaminophen is a generic name. So over-the-counter is like, the, you don't just look at the brand name. You have to actually look, go look in the ingredients and make sure you, you add all everything up and anything that has a acetaminophen component, add them up and keep it under four grams a day. And then if you have very poor nutrition, like you're sick, you don't want to eat, you starve yourself for a few days, you want to keep it way below four grams too, or you're at more risk of the liver toxicity. You, you, you might end up overdosing yourself. Even older people should have less, so yeah. less than three grams. That's a lot. And then the alcohol, you don't want to combine alcohol with the Tylenol. <laughs> and then our next question from Alice Jenkins. She asks, why does diabetes cause kidney damage? Great question. I think uh, we talked a little bit about it, <clears throat> but diabetes affects the blood vessels, uh, the small blood vessels of your body. So what by what I mean is, uh, they cause endothelial damage. So the blood vessel is made of uh, three parts, endothelium, epithelium. Uh, so without going into the anatomy, the endothelium is the inner lining of the blood vessels that is affected by uh, diabetes, the high blood sugar. Uh, so once the endothelium is damaged, uh, the, the flow in the blood vessel slows down and that part of the organ that that blood vessel is supplying is not getting enough uh, oxygen and enough blood. So when it happens in the kidney uh, with that endothelial damage, uh, the tubules in the kidney are not able to filter the, uh, the urine that is supposed to take all the bad things out from your body. So um, that's what is causing the initial damage and the protein starts going out and you know, you're not able to absorb the protein and keep it in the blood that it's supposed to. But once you start getting the protein out, um, the endothelial damage is what's causing um, the damage in the kidney and everywhere else. Uh, it affects the nerves, that causes neuropathy, it affects the heart, causes uh, you know, heart disease, and it can affect, because we have blood vessels everywhere in the body, you know, starting from head to toe. So that's what diabetes does is a disease of the small vessels. So the minute capillaries that are in the body are affected and they get damaged. They start getting damaged the endothelial uh, cells. Uh, that's at the cellular level. Mm -hmm. uh, again, uh, there's a lot of other things that diabetes can do. That's why it's called the silent killer. You don't even know what's going on inside. So is it the sugar that's affecting the nerves and, and the Kidneys, the glomerulus, and then uh, what they call the neuropathy. They could be yeah. Anywhere. So no, it's the blood, the endothelium of the blood vessels. When that gets damaged, yeah, the high sugar is damaging it because our normal sugar should be 100. So when the sugar goes up to two, three hundred, four hundred, uh, it's not going to be filtered and it's going to damage the endothelium. So then you start getting um, the side effects of endothelial damage. And uh, that causes all these uh, vascular diseases that you get, you know, strokes and heart attacks and uh, kidney damage and neuropathy everywhere. It affects, like, like I said, from head to toe. Yeah. Kind of on the subject of sugars, what about like um, uh, sugar substitutes and zero calorie drinks and low carb drinks? Um, 
how, how do those affect your body and is it better just to have regular sugar? <laughs> yeah, I mean, sugar is sugar, so it's carbohydrates, so go ahead. Um, I think there's a good purpose behind like sugar substitutes, like, you know, Splenda, Sweet and Bow, in the sense that the patient can kind of have a little better control of their blood sugars, but still kind of have that sweet element to the food. Um, having said that, there's not a whole lot of studies out there to kind of show the long-term effects of these sugar substitutes which is where we run into issues of like the long-term use of them. So um, obviously it's an individual choice. Um, it, I think used appropriately, they can add a benefit to that, you know, diabetic patient. But if, um, you know, being diabetic, if you're craving something sweet, then maybe look for something that doesn't have any sugar. Or, um, for example, I tend to recommend mock fruit. So it's more natural, sweetener, um, won't have any effect on your blood sugars and things like that. So again, I think it's an individual choice for the reasons I mentioned, um, but there 